Hello? It's been a while. Okay. So. It's been a minute since I've played this game. Um, we'll see how many character voices I remember, but what I do remember is that things are normal and uh, there's a, there was a random mouse, it looked like, who had just come out of some time loop, doesn't exist out of time, some Doctor Who weird shit has been happening. Anyways, chapter six. The source. Nat expressed his sympathy with a shrug and sauntered off as unassumingly as he'd arrived. He'd given Luca and Iggy what they needed and nothing more. As Luca sprinted across the snow, the events of the past few days became clearer, pieces to a larger puzzle. Rollo said he was underground somewhere, captured. Mr. Kerr tried to cover it up with lies. The clipboards were hell-bent on capturing Iggy. It all seemed to point to perennial harvest. But right now, there was one thing that Luca needed to know. Right. We had, like, gone outside of time and now we're back. Luca stopped dead in his tracks. The tree was gone, uprooted and moved, leaving a raw gash in the earth. He dropped to his knees and dug wildly at the cold snow. His numb hands hit something hard. A headstone. A dry whisper escaped Luca's lips. You're here. All this time I thought I was visiting you. But you've been here, alone, in the snow. Dad, I'm so sorry. It's a weird energy to start the stream with. They ruined your favorite spot in the world. Our favorite spot in the world. Dad, what do I do? There was no reply. Just snow-covered silence. Why'd you give why'd you give me the slip like that? What if I couldn't find you, you jerk? Iggy finally noticed the tears welling in Luca's eyes and the snow-covered grave. Uh, oh. Iggy, they they stole this tree, Iggy. Yikes. Suddenly, they heard the crunch of approaching footsteps in the snow. We gotta hide. Two five nine K. Fall off distance still good. Dude, did you hear me? I said two five nine. Sorry. You ever think about what we did here? We saved a whole people a whole town of people. Doesn't feel like it sometimes. What about everything we left behind? That's the grave of someone with a family. The people who love them will never know the truth. The truth is overrated. He bent down to scoop up a snowball and lobbed it playfully. No, no idea who these two are, so they just get the same voice. Hey, don't be such a downer, dude. We took this job to change the world. Yeah, come on. It's almost lunchtime. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Weirdo. Okay. I. Do you think that was Luca and Rolo from like the future or something? <laughs> Anyways. Here I thought I was a jerk. These dinguses are out here literally dancing on graves. Luca stuttered through heaving sobs. I thought I was visiting him. I thought he was with me. I'm not gonna lie, that's a bad break. Here's some advice. He gave Luca a solid smack on the back of his head. Hey! Who's any of this helping? What? Sitting here in the snow, crying like some pushover. Who ya helping? Iggy, look what they did. They lied to everyone. Blah, blah, blah. Luca Van Horn, you're a lot of things, but you ain't no pushover. What did I tell you before? When some jerk comes at you acting like a horse's ass, I should stand up for myself. Hell yeah. Her and his merry little band of clipboards pulled, pulled off this switcheroo for a reason, right? Nat mentioned something about a source. Luca wiped his eyes with a sleeve. 
Whatever is at the source must be awfully valuable to a perennial harvest. Sure would be a shame if something unfortunate were to happen to this precious source, wouldn't it? What do you have in mind? If it's small enough to steal, we snatch it. If it's too big to snatch, we smash it. And what if it's too big to smash? He flashed a mischievous smile and cracked his knuckles. I'm always up for a challenge. Iggy actually coming through as the MVP here. I'm gonna make this right, Dad, I promise. Let's do this. Alright, let's locate the source. I feel like we're coming to the end of the game. This is only like session four, and it's been like across multiple months. I think it's, the breaks have just been getting longer and longer. I think this is... Oh yeah, this is, this is, um, the asshole. It can get awful cold out there in those woods, Luca. Probably best you two stay put and conserve your energy. Help's on the way. Where's Rolo? Where's my mom? Did you kill her? Oh, heavens no. I seem like a killer to you. Iggy and Luca shared a skeptical look. Well, do I? Oh shucks. Now that hurts my feelings. Screw that guy. Okay. So I guess we're not gonna stay put. We gotta go this way? No, I guess we're going down. I thought we came from this way, but okay. Oh right. Okay, it's just one direction. I thought we came from this direction. Okay, we're just going back. Wait a minute. If this is the original town, then that means... Iggy darted behind a large pine and began digging furiously. He emerged holding a shoebox with a crude skull painted on its lid. Oh. What's that? Long story. So, a few years back, I, uh, came into possession of some premium-grade fireworks. Not the wimpy firecracker stuff they give kids. The good stuff. So, why did you bury it under a tree? That's the long part of the story. You and Rolo were doing chores at Rolo's chicken coop, and you guys pissed me off for some reason or another. rolled his eyes with realization. No, you didn't. He stifled a chuckle. <laughs> yep. I just wanted to give you guys a little scare. But, like I said, these were some primo fireworks. So I might have underestimated things. You blew up the chicken coop? I prefer to think of it as an incendiary redecoration. Sorry, but you should have seen the looks on your faces. Rolo got grounded for months, which is why I needed to stash the evidence and lay low. So I buried them under the tree. But when I came back for them later, they were gone. I figured some grown-up found them and tossed them. Iggy triumphantly raised the shoebox. Turns out, it wasn't the fireworks that got moved. It was us. Unbelievable. Literally unbelievable. All right. Okay. Do you think this is a game? News flash, boyo. You're not a hero. You're a little brat who is in way over his head. A hero is just someone who refuses to give up. Comics these days are rotting children's brains. Everyone thinks they're a spaceman superhero. I always... I was always partial to Hank Atomic myself. Is that so? Do you really think you have a chance against us? You have no idea how powerful we are. Prepare for blast off, loser. Oh, okay, hole. Right, I remember the hole. All right, sure, let's go in the hole. Echo! 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 Whoa. I can see why they wanted to move us all out of town now. 
But why would they dig a giant hole? I think this is it. <laughs> Got it. Found it. This is the source? It's a dang hole? How do we smash a hole? Uh-oh. Oh, it's much more than that, my annoying little friend. Kerr. Where's Rollo? I wasn't lying before. He's safe. Well, before the... Well, safer than you two, at least. Oh, no, he's gonna push him in the hole. Hold. You just had to drag me all the way out here, didn't you? Mr. Kerr gazed down the abyss in contemplation. It really is something, isn't it? What did you do to our town? What is all of this? Well, that's a doozy of a question. This is the source where they collect the unrefined, uh... scratched the back of his head. Honestly, boys, I don't understand any of this well enough to explain it. Fact of the matter is, I'm not paid to know. What do you mean you don't know? Ain't you in charge? Oh, heavens no. My role is merely to flash a winning smile and manage various... complications. Complications like us. You are a smart His boy. His face contorted into a saccharine grin. It really is nothing personal. Some people are destined to strive for greatness, and others are simply obstacles along the way. Seems like you were destined to be a creepy lackey. The point is that we all play our part in life. Mine just happened to be a lead in the role of a lifetime. And you happen to be extras, ready for your curtain call. You are giving up without a f We aren't giving up without a fight. Your smile's not gonna be so winning after we're done with you. Now, boys, there's no need for melodrama. It makes even a professional such as myself embarrassed for you. Let's change the mood a bit. Her snapped his fingers. Oh god. Scene change. Uh oh. There, that's better. Deal with them. Iggy turned to Luca with a sly glance. Why are you smirking? Because I have a box full of fireworks and you don't. Iggy uh -oh. waved the box into the air, threatening to drop it down the hole. Stop! Let's not do something regrettable. <laughs> Joke's on you. Regret is one of my special... <laughs> As cell phone. Regret is one of my specialties. Out of curiosity, what would happen if I threw these in your precious hole? Nothing. Nothing at all. You're a terrible liar. I'll have you know, I'm an exceptional liar. But, 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 that's far enough. Piggy plucked a single bottle rocket from the box and held it up with reverence. Stop, you fool! Call off your goons. After a long pause, Mr. Kerr flung up his hand with frustration. Very well. You all can head back to that for the night. It's been a long day. I'll handle these two from here. Mr. Kerr sighed into the frigid air. It's just us now, Iggy. You can put that down. What, like this? With a nonchalant flick, Iggy tossed the firework into the hole. <laughs> oh. Whoa. With a growl, Kerr leapt at Iggy, crashing through Luca. Oh, God. <laughs> Iggy tried to twist away, but in the struggle, they both tumbled over the side. Luca dove forward, bracing Iggy's hand just before it slipped. His grip was made precarious by the cold, wet snow. He could see Kerr further down, clinging to Iggy's coat. You reckless child, what have you done? Luca, listen to me. Hold on tight and use the walkie-talkie to call them back. Oh, um, what channel do I use? It doesn't make a damn difference. They're always listening. 
If I do that, the clipboards will just haul us up and snag us. If you do that, the clipboards will just haul us up and snag us both. The only way you get out of this is if Kerr is out of the picture. Just let go and save yourself. If he lets go, we both die. I don't want to die, but seeing the look on your face always makes it, almost makes it worth it. Mr. Kerr, we've had a long life. You've had a long life. Why don't you actually do something selfless and just let go? Mr. Kerr gasped with insult. <gasps> long life? I'll have you know I can still play 25. You should have heard me sing the part of Phileas Young. Look in his eye, Mr. Kerr began to hum a proud melody. <laughs> wow, can you believe this guy? Oh, okay, I got a hum. Great. I gave him a very nervous, bad hum, but I got a really nice token out of it. His voice began to crack. Kerr, just let go. No can do. If you want to save your friend, you'll have to save me too. Luca, look at me. It's okay. Luca felt Iggy loosen his grasp. You aren't going to kill your friend like that, are you? Every muscle in Luca's body burned. I'm not his friend. Yes, you are. Nah, I'm just a no-good bully. Like you, Kerr. Iggy, no. Luca felt his hand slipping. And I told you what you need to do with bullies. I can't. It's your only way out of this mess. Two birds with one stone. It makes sense for us to fall together. Wackadoos travel in packs. A calm settled over Iggy's face. Luca, let me do this. Iggy's voice was colder than the bitter air billowing from the chasm. Let me do the right thing for once. Oh my god. Luca had no choice but to something in his request. Ah! I don't like that this- I don't like that I get to choose this. This sucks. I can't. No. No. I can't. I need to take- I need to take some tea. Oh my god. What the fuck do I do? Well, this sucks. I can't, right? I feel like... <laughs> I feel like 20 minutes in, this is, uh, this is a bit too soon for um, a main character death. Luca had no choice but to refuse Iggy's request. He tightened his grip and reached for the walkie-talkie in his pocket. It's the bad choice, but, you know. A wild delight crept onto Mr. Kerr's face. That's a good lad. Now, radio for help. Icky begged Luca with his eyes one last time, but Luca pressed the button and called out. We, we need help. Mr. Kerr is in danger. <sighs> it wasn't long before they were once again surrounded by clipboards. Mr. Kerr sighed with relieved frustration. There you are. You really are a worthless lot, aren't you? Mirror, now. A clipboard dutifully produced an ornate ivory hand mirror, and Mr. Kerr began preening his tussled hair. Ah, that's better. Mr. Van Horn, I applaud your sharp thinking under duress. I'll put in a good word for you with the founder. Take them away. A swarm of hands overpowered Luca. The last thing he saw before a cloth bag was pulled over his head was the defeated look on Iggy's face. The end. Ah, damn it. I knew it. I knew it was a bad end. God damn it. Hmm. I think this was one of those times where doing the right thing was the yeah, wrong thing. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. All right. Fuck. We tried. Luca had no choice but to accept Iggy's request. With a quiet blink, Luca watched a teardrop sail down into the howling void. As his fingers slowly gave up, he met eyes with Iggy. Good.
the two silhouettes were swallowed by darkness. this thing <laughs> I'm immediately antagonistic I don't trust I don't trust them I also don't remember this thing's pronouns <sighs> oh well Luca you should really step back what quickly oh god curious Fireworks of Vicky's must have been just the right amount of energy. We should get out of here before perennial harvest arrives. Not until you tell me what just happened. Your friend's sacrifice just saved this town. For a little while, anyway. How? Tempest Liquimi Liquimini Liquimine. Tempest Liquimine is a pe peculiar substance. It can change the relationship between matter and time itself. But doing so requires unfathomable energy. In a closed system, that energy can only come from its surroundings. A useful side product of this property being, by adding preciously the correct amount of energy to it, one can create a cryogenic cascade. So, the gunk makes things cold, and the fireworks made the cold freeze over. I don't know why I'm giving him Iggy's voice now. It's one way of putting it, yes. As dumb luck would have it, the fireworks weren't strong enough to generate a runaway reaction. I shudder to think what would have happened in that case. We have some idea what that would look like. We do, and why did it happen in that case? Because there's a, there's a scenario where things freeze over. It will take some... It will take them a good while to safely break through and access the source again. If you know all of this stuff, why haven't you been helping? I have been. In, a, in my way. Each one of us has our role to play. Iggy's role, it turns out was to buy us precious time. Mine has been to observe and wait. Wait for what? You. M me? Why? What's my role? A fierce twinkle flashed in Nat's eyes. Luca Van Horn, you are going to save the world. Normal. With a chuckle, Nat turned and walked west. Dumbfounded. Luca followed behind him, trudging through the snow. Every step taking him further away from everyone and everything he knew, and closer to destiny. To be continued in Beacon Pines, Pines Harder. No. Revenge served cold. Second time's a charm? Okay. Wait, that's it? This ends with a crummy cliffhanger, just when it was getting good? I was even starting to like Iggy. Damn. No way. I refuse to be associated with some never-ending parade of sequels. Let's go back and find something more definitive. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Alright. Okay, so I've tried fight or flight. Okay, we're gonna go back this way. All right. Oh, okay. All right. Time to do some questioning. They'd run the classic good cop, hard cop. They'd run the classic good cop, hard cop interrogation. Rollo brandished a steely gaze. I've got this. Read about it a hundred times. 
Willow swaggered past the chair which propped up the slumping Hiram Tolliver. Without even looking at his captive, he began with a long, blustery drawl. Well, 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 Mr. Tolliver. Mr. Tolliver remained motionless. Rollo spun around to face him. He'd clearly expected to rouse Mr. Tolliver with his booming voice. Mr. Tolliver? Beck and Luca gave each other an unsure glance. Rollo slammed his fist on the table. I said... Mr. Tolliver! He grabbed the table lamp and beamed it onto the unconscious face. Mr. Tolliver groaned and slowly lifted his head. Uh, he recoiled with a muddled, weary squint. What in the world? The chair wobbled as he attempted to straighten up. Wh who... who's there? Mr. Tolliver could only make out rough shapes through the glaring light. With a gruff tone, Rollo hoped to both conceal his voice and intimidate. I'll be asking the questions here, punk. Now, hold on, let's just calm down. Oh, I am calm. Calm as a carrot in dirt. As for you, looks like you're sweating. The doubtful expression on Beck and Luca's faces transformed into awe. We can do this my way, or... Well, let's just say, I've never needed another way. Rollo, hitting his stride, was now channeling every detective trope his memory could recall. He slammed the table again. Now dance! <laughs> what? I, I don't even... Oliver's voice became desperate. He was nearly in tears. <laughs> You've tied me down. How on earth could I dance? <laughs> Dance with your mouth, punk. Spill the beans. What are you doing poking around in this house? I, I'm here to help Juniper. I have to make sure everything's ready. Oh, so you're in cahoots with Gran? Gr Gran? Mr. Tolliver was in a daze, now more confused than ever. Gonna help her blow up the festival, eh? Blow up the festival? Good lord! His head, feeling more and more dizzy. No, no, you've got it all wrong. Where is she now? She's headed to the source. The s source? What's the source? It's where... His faded to a whisper. The town began. It's where it all began. What is Operation Sparkplug? With that, Mr. Tolliver passed out cold. Okay, all right. Rollo swung around with a repentant grimace. Damn, Rollo. I think you went a little too hard on him. What did he say about the source? It's where the town began? We need more information. Yeah, but we'd better not put Mr. Tolliver, push Mr. Tolliver any further. Is there anyone else who might know more? What about the History Museum? It just got set up for the festival. Nah, that tent was put up by the Valentines. Everything they do is just a bunch of fluff to glorify themselves. Is there anything more reliable? The library? If there's any information about the source thing, Kato, uh, Kato can help us find it. Let's go get some answers. All right, we're here, we're at the library. I gotta check in on the comic though. Okay, I can't. I'm not allowed. Can't have fun. This is a dang nice library. Thanks! We work hard on it! Aren't you a little too... adorable to be a librarian? Adorable. Ow! Uh... Kato, uh, Kato hung out here so much, eventually they gave him a set of keys. I just keep my... I just keep an eye on the place as Mr. Tovic some for Mr. Tovic sometimes. They got you working for free. It's quiet and I get access to all the books I can read. What more could a person want? Fair enough. What can I do for you all? We need a favor. I already told you and Rollo. I can put you I can't put you any higher on the wait list for the next atom Hank next Hank Atomic. And if you're here with more candy, I'll have you know I can't be bought. Call it a 
personal code of conscience. Actually, we're looking to do some research. Now you're speaking my language. What are you looking for? That's the thing. We sort of don't know. What do you got on the history of the town? Hmm, that's... There's the county record archives. What's in those? Birds. Or births. <laughs> births, deaths, newspaper clippings, stuff like that. Pretty boring read. But they do, do go all the way back to when the town was founded. Great, we'll start there. Okay. Chapter 8. Ooh. Chapter 8. Six feet under, three towns over. The kids spent the rest of the afternoon combing through dusty piles of old county records, desperately searching for anything that could help them make sense of Mr. Tolliver's cryptic utterance. Luca tried to shake the thought of Grand's basement, but his focus wavered. Explosives, messages hidden in jam, dossiers on various town figures, and a court. Gran was the only family he had left. He still couldn't bring himself to believe the worst. I can't go back. But the old map with the symbol of explosives in Town Square made that difficult. As the sun began to set, the kids were no closer to the truth. If I have to read any more records, my eyeballs are gonna pop. We have to keep digging. If I dig another word, I'm gonna end up in one of those uh, uh, asinine death one of these asinine death records. Rolo Cotter lived a full and wonderful life till he read so much boring crud that his brain oozed out of his ears. Rolo shut his book with an assertive nod. If you've got a better idea, spit it out. You sound like my sister. Keep pushing your luck, pal. And it won't be boring county records that kill you. I'll put you in the obituaries myself. Rolo muttered under his breath. You're a county record. Really? That's the best you've got? When I'm done with you, you'll be the f you'll be a f the foot- it is the- you'll be the footnote in history. Just like- Beck slammed her finger down on the open page before glancing down to read. J. Hartman here. I'd love to see you try. Hey, hey, hey! We're all a little tired here. Let's just take a minute Something and- Something tickled the back of Luca's mind. Wait. What was that name, Beck? Uh, in the obit, uh, J. Hartman, uh, Hartford, from the Brookville Tribune eight years ago. That can't be right. What is it? J. Hartford. That's my grand's name, Juniper Hartford. Fuck. Uh, maybe there's two J. Hartfords? Mrs. Hartford is survived by her young daughter, E. Hartford. My mom's name is Eleanor. Okay, this is getting creepy. If your gran is six feet under, three towns over, then who am I living with? The question hung in the air. All right, gang, I gotta close up for the night. Beck rubbed her eyes. How late is it? Almost ten. Oh crap, Pa's gonna kill me. I gotta go. Yeah, my parents still will be worried sick. Okay, let's meet up as early as we can at the festival tomorrow. What are you gonna do about the unconscious man in your basement? I'll think of something. Luca's heart was pounding as he approached the house. If he was lucky, Gran, or whoever it was, hadn't gotten back yet. And of course, there was Mr. Tolliver tied up and unconscious in the basement. Dealing with him would be the first order of business. Luca shook out his arms to calm his nerves before entering. He held perfectly still, tempering his breath, and listened closely. She was asleep. His only hope was that she hadn't found Mr. Tolliver before dozing off. Hmm. What happens if I do this? Okay. 
<laughs> Sometimes I just like a little chaos. All right, there's no way that she didn't. You just left it open? No. Yeah, that's, of course. Oh, no. Mr. Tolliver was nowhere to be seen. Maybe he woke up, escaped from his bindings, and left without a trace. Or maybe Gran knew everything. What do I do? Luca's hungry stomach groaned. Not realizing it, he'd gone the entire day without eating. Okay, I can figure this out. Just need a little brain food. Luca rushed over to the pile of jam jars, unscrewed one, oh, no. and shoveled a handful into his mouth. I'm afraid your jam delivery will be delayed. He flipped the lid to read the label. Mr. Nuncreed, huh? <laughs> okay, now I can think. Some of that jelly is explosive jelly, right? That's the thing. That's like... Huh. Anyways. Some of it's not jelly. And I'm glad... He... I'm hoping he didn't just eat not jelly. So, if Gran knows we tied up Mr. Tolliver, I'm screwed. If she doesn't know, then I need to play it cool. I guess the only option is to go to bed and act as if nothing is wrong. Gran will think Mr. Tolliver finished what he was sent to do and left when he was done. Sure, yeah, that sh I'm sure that will go perfectly well and nothing bad will happen. I'm, this music is definitely, yeah, all right. Gran? Okay, stick to the plan. Go to bed and play it cool. Oh, As no. Luca climbed the final stair, the emotion of the day dragged heavily on him. With each consecutive step, his legs weakened. His stride began to falter. He tried to grab for the railing to steady himself. Yeah. Something was wrong. Yeah, he didn't eat jam. He didn't eat jelly just now. Come on, legs. Just a few more steps. Luca groaned and tried to move. His limbs might as well have been bolted to the ground. Through numb lips, he mumbled just before falling asleep. The germ. Complete. <laughs> Did it. Sweet boy. What did you get yourself into? Press now and let me handle everything. Chapter 9 A speech to end all speeches. I feel like we're getting close. Luca awoke to find himself face down in bed. He moaned into his pillow. Why would Gran drug him? Or rather, why was she trying to drug Mr. Nuncreed? Nuncreed's the creep, I'm pretty sure. That's like reason enough, in my opinion. Shaking the questions from his woozy head, Luca snapped back to the matter at hand. The festival! Where's the... I want the ball. Where's the ball? Tragic. Oh. So I can try the door. Okay. Alright, you never know. Gran is not going to be out here, right? No. Alright. Off to the festival. Like I should have gone. <laughs> eh, no, let's, let's take some time. I don't think we're going to get to see the grave. This is where it began. Alright. Off to the festival.
Where have you been? I, uh, Grant put something in the jam. Yeah, we know. Secret messages for secret conspirators. Not this one. The one intended for Mr. Nuncreed. Put me to sleep. Whoa, ho ho. Sly devil. Okay, I got two new things. I think she's trying to remove him from the equation. He might be in danger. Have you found anything? We looked around, but haven't seen any anything odd. Your gran is nowhere to be found. But Mr. Nuncreed is just loafing around waiting for the speech. What speech? Mayor Gus just got up, up to the podium. Everyone is gathering at the stage. Let's get moving. Festival day! It's here. Augustus we made Valentine it. nervously wiped his brow. Um, <clears throat> is this thing? Um, hello, Beacon Pines. I am Augustus Valentine, your mayor, and I suppose you already know that. Um, oh yes, before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment to recognize someone we could who couldn't be here today. This town wouldn't be where it is today without my father, Sharper Valentine. So I thought we could begin with a round of applause befitting such a great man. Yeah. Even that's more than the odd codger deserved. Gus cleared his throat and awkwardly loosened his tie. Oh, right. Where was I? Ian Kerr bounded on the stage with the energy of a preacher at a big tent revival. <laughs> Gus Valentine, everyone! He gave Gus a hearty slap on the back and motioned him off the stage. Let's hear it for our mayor. What a great turnout! Oh, heck, I didn't prepare anything. But I suppose I could say a few words. It would be a shame to waste such a beautiful podium. Mr. Kerr pulled a thick stack of note cards out from his vest. Community, conviction, commitment. These are the things we celebrate at Perennial Harvest. For us, these are the pillars of the bridge to a better tomorrow. But I think it's time to add a new pillar. Hello. Change. Change is a powerful thing. It's inexorable, unavoidable, and undeniable. And I am dadgum thankful for it. Change is the reason we're all together today. It's hard for me to believe that it was all four years ago when fate brought me here. A simple business trip which brought me to a small town which would change my life forever. Mr. Kerr took a moment to survey the crowd. You know what? He wiped away a single tear. From the second I set foot in Beacon Pines, something about this place has held me captive. You see, change represents opportunity. It represents potential. It was change that helped me recognize the potential of this place. To see that the people of this town, despite suffering great loss, still held on to the things that made them special. He thumped the podium to emphasize each word. <laughs> Thank you. Community, conviction, commitment, change. Mr. Kerr nodded confidently, biting his lip. The crowd was silent, in rapt attention. Fate made a perfect match that day. Nothing is more important to you all than community. And Perennial Harvest is a community first and foremost. Mr. methodically made eye contact with each section of the crowd. The only way you made it through the foul harvest was an unshakable conviction. A conviction that a better tomorrow was just over the horizon. Perennial Harvest was founded on the conviction that we are that horizon. 
That festival, or this festival, is a symbol of our commitment to each other. Began to build to a crescendo. We now walk hand in hand into a future we will shape together. And that is what change is all about. Grabbing the future by the scruff of the neck and taking, making things happen. Change is a choice. I am tickled pink that we will all be making that choice together. How great is that? Just imagine what we can accomplish. Uh-oh. What was that? The crowd began to look around nervously. Don't worry, a little thunder isn't going to ruin this day. Everyone remain calm. Mr. Kerr quickly flicked through his note cards. Uh, where was I? Uh, through all of my travels, I have learned one true thing. One always reaps what they sow. We have all planted a lot of good in this town. And so it is with a happy heart that I can proclaim... He raised his hands up to the heavens. Our harvest awaits. Yeah, I saw that coming. At that moment, a merciless wall of impossibly cold air ripped through the crowd, instantly freezing everyone and everything it touched. For a man like William Kerr, this was a fitting way for things to end. On a stage, with an entire town frozen in rapt attention for the rest of the oh. end. Second time I skipped that for the rest of the time. There's that ice again. Whenever I think we're getting close, it comes along and ruins everything. Maybe we should just quit. Maybe you should just close the book, walk away, and never think of me again. No, I. I don't mean that. We got a little closer this time. We just need to try again. Please. All right. All right, so we got two more paths, so we can try... Oh, wait, I thought we got two. Interesting. I guess there's one that we haven't unlocked yet. All right, well... Back here. They'd run the classic good cop, sly cop interrogation. Luca and Rollo ducked behind a barrel, leaving Beck to her task. <laughs> With a few crisp snaps, she roused Mr. Tolliver. So, uh, the vibes here are great. I have no idea what's happening. I'm having a great time. Yeah, so the premise so far is like, this is like a mystery game but it's non-linear and so there's branching paths and we've been slowly unlocking things, but like we're outside the narrative, but also we're not at some point. It's interesting. There's dreams that happen um, and it feels like we're hitting climax uh, soon. So yeah, things are things are interesting. Right now, uh, yeah, yeah, it's... it's... <laughs> uh, so right now, uh, I believe, if I remember, because the, the last time I played this was, like, months ago. Um, these three, the main characters, have, like, basically kidnapped this man because he is in cahoots with the main character's supposed grandmother, who we just learned... Ignoring that. Uh, who we just learned isn't actually his grandmother, is, like, faking uh, and use and, like, taking the identity of his grandmother... Uh, who was in the obituary that we found. Uh, and they have some explosives in their basement. Yep. Yeah. Uh, all right. What? What's going on here? You're that Modeville girl. Please, call me back. Sorry about all this. Mr. Tolliver looked down and shifted a bit, testing his restraints. It seems there's been a mix-up. You see, I'm down here for the same reason you are. Juniper sent you here? Beck caught herself before letting the surprise manifest on her face. Uh, technically the grandmother has bombs, and also this man who they kidnapped. This is the secret room they uncovered, and they've now taken him to the secret room. 
she'd already gotten him to reveal his relation to Grand. This was gonna be easy. You know how Juniper is with her precautions. Operation Sparkplug, pl Operation Sparkplug has us all on edge. I guess she thought you needed some backup. But she sent a child? What better way to avoid prying eyes? Who would suspect a kid? I suppose that makes sense. Mr. Tolliver wriggled a bit in his restraints. Oh, I'm so sorry. Beck quickly removed the ropes. That had to be uncomfortable. A little, yeah. But you understand. We never know who to trust in this Mr. town. Mr. Tolliver rubbed the growing knot on his forehead. Uh, very true. So it turns out we're both here to... Beck twirled her hand, as if to prompt Mr. Tolliver to finish her thought. Uh, destroy the evidence. Beck shook her head and clicked her tongue. Yep. The good, ol the good old gal is nothing if not thorough. Mr. Tolliver let out an amused huff in agreement. <laughs> she sure is. Can't blame her, though. If anyone were to find out that we're going to destroy the source, oh, it is them. Well, well, we both know how bad that would m might be. No one will know anything once I finish cleaning things up down here. Beck was on a roll now, playing Mr. Tolliver like a fiddle. You're sure you can finish this up on your own? Juniper, Juniper trusted me for a reason. You can leave the rest to me. Good. There is one more loose end I'll go work on. Loose end? Oh, it's nothing, really. The other day, I had the radio on scan while restocking the candy shelf, and wouldn't you know it, I intercepted an odd phrase in the perennial harvest transmission. Underground secrets. That's ominous. Yeah, I, I think it might be a password, but Juniper dismissed it. Uh, said it wasn't mission critical. What's the password for? We don't know. So, we have a password and know where to put it. It's gonna mean something, right? Good thinking. You should probably go work that out. I've got this under control. That's a relief. Between you and me, this basement gives me the willies. Heading for the stairs, Mr. Tolliver hesitated and turned to Beck with a puzzled look. She grinned and gave him a peppy wave. With a shrug, he continued up the stairs, whistling a jaunty tune. You guys catch that? Sure did. This whole time, Mr. Tulliver's had a candy shelf. But all he ever sells us is apples! Beck blinked slowly in disappointment. The password, Rollo. Well, sure, but once things are back to normal, I'll be having a word with Mr. Tulliver about that candy shelf. Fine. In the meantime, I've got an idea. She turned to the table and began tearing small scraps of paper. He said he heard a, ra a password on the radio. Any good spy transmission is never what it seems. Beck marked each scrap of paper and leaned back. We just need to find the hidden meaning. Okay. Uh, hmm, okay. What's another word for underground? Buried... Covered... Could it be a cover-up? Maybe it's one of those each letter is a number thingies. The so U would be 21, N would be 14, D would be... Ooh, it's an anagram. Nung Creed's Drugstore. Luca and Beck looked at Rolo with amazement. Rolo, that was incredible. Well, it's either that or Kren's new drugstore. Yeah, I think you were right the first time. How did you do that? What can I say? I love ciphers. Well, I guess we know where to go now. Love that. Rolo had his time to shine. All right, uh, so Nuncreed uh, is, oh, interesting. Why are you here? You scared me half to death. Sorry. You kids haven't seen Mr. Tulliver around here, have you? Oh! He's got me waiting around like a, the last slice of pie. I swear that man would be late to his own festival. Funeral. Also festival. Uh, so Mr. Nuncreed is, um... 
a creepy old man who's like always hits on our fake grandmother uh, and also in one of the endings kidnaps us. You're late, Augustus. Sorry, sister. Was caught up with work. Work? You? I had a few more details to lock down for the festival. Oh, what do you have to report? What is this insipid town festival really about? I think... Gus looked around nervously. I think Mr. Kerr really does just want to do something good for the town. He's actually a pretty nice guy. You should spend some time with him. We didn't pull strings installing you as mayor so that you could make friends. Your job is to help me figure out what Kerr and Perennial Harvest's true intentions are with this town. We have a responsibility. This is our father's town. Was. Excuse me? This was our father's town. He's gone, Eris, and he isn't coming back. Father left us with nothing but problems. Mr. Kerr came here and offered to help us. We accepted that help. We didn't agree to them turning father's warehouse into a toxic dumping ground. This is just a temporary arrangement. The glow can be seen from our damned backyard. They are dumping their nasty little secrets on us. When all, when this all inevitably goes wrong, who do you think will be blamed? Eris's cry hung in the air. <laughs> the Twin Peaks of it all. Yeah, basically. Uh, actually, this is like huge Twin Peaks vibes, except not. It doesn't get like uncomfortable in season two. There is no season two. <laughs> We have a new choice to make now, sister. This town is going to change whether we like it or not. Are we going to choose to be a part of that future? Or be forgotten in the past? It's a shame. Father named you Augustus, but you always will... You will always just be a Gus. Good night, Eris. I'll see you at breakfast tomorrow. It's getting late, children. Cool. Oh, uh, so this is my favorite character. Good. Okay, so this is my favorite character. She always has, like, a cryptic thing she reads from the book, and the cryptic thing is always how this branch ends. It's great. Knowledge, he spat with a snare. There exists a gulf between knowing something and being able to do a damn thing about it. Hmm. I do hate it when the villain makes a good point. All right, cool. So that's what's gonna happen. There we go, Nuncreed's drugstore. Solomon stood proudly at the entrance to the drugstore, holding a brown bag overflowing with black licorice. Hey, Solomon. We're looking for Mr. Nuncreed. Is he still in there? I don't remember what voice I gave this kid. I'm afraid not. When, then where'd you get the candy from? You might say we have an arrangement. Solomon shoveled a surprising amount of licorice into his mouth. Sometimes the small, small pleasures in life. Though we might not always have family to rely on. Licorice has never let me down. Well, I can't say licorice would be my first choice, but whatever floats your boat. I can tell you a lot about a per- uh, You can tell a lot about a person by their choice of confection. Oh, yeah, I guess. I like sour gobs. I'm certain you do. I always wondered why Mr. Nuncreed kept licorice in stock. You must eat enough of it to make it worthwhile. There are many ways to earn loyalty. For some, it's as easy as cold, hard cash. Well, he's right. It's locked. There's gotta be more clues. Okay, let's see. Okay, I, I do know one thing, because we were kidnapped one time. Have you ever seen anyone actually use this thing? Besides Mr. Nuncreed, no. 
Beck cupped her hands on the glass to peek inside. This is not a normal phone booth. It's got like a blinky keypad. Why would there be a blinky keypad? Creed's new drugstore! Or Kren's new drugstore. I mean, underground secrets! The password! Beck flung open the door and they all squeezed in. All right, time to go to an area that I haven't been to in any of the paths yet. All right, let's see here. Luca cracked his knuckles and entered the letters into the keypad. Underground secrets. Sounds like that did something. Great, now what? I guess we- ah! The inside of the phone booth dropped loose from its shell. Without even the space to panic, they closed their eyes, held their breath, and accepted their fate. Suddenly, the chaotic descent slowed to an effortless landing. And we'll figure out what that is uh, in a bit. I am going to take a break. I will be right back.